Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, a look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. Hello, I'm Walter Cronkite. He only had an eighth grade education. Yet, for a dozen years, the press referred to him as one of the most powerful people in the nation. In the darkest days of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt called on him to help save railroads, banks, farms, and businesses. When World War loomed, the President turned to him again to help the Allied nations prepare for battle. But I first knew of him when I was growing up in Houston. It seemed like the tallest buildings in town all belonged to him. He was Jesse Holman Jones. Time magazine once reported, to many a U.S. citizen, great and small, if Jesse Jones says, okay, okay. And Jones' crony, humorous Will Rogers, was fond of saying, I get all my money information from Jesse Jones. In one way or another, so did the rest of the nation. He's a forgotten hero from one of the most important chapters in our nation's history. Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? The story of Jesse H. Jones. Well, we're very pleased to have as our guest today Stephen Fenberg, uh, an author and biographer of one of America's underappreciated heroes, Jesse Holman Jones the legendary banker, entrepreneur, and government executive uh, that Walter Cronkite was just describing. Jones uh, turned Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Reconstruction Finance Corporation into the, the largest bank in the world, which happened to save the American economy and capitalism uh, and, and extracted us from the Great Depression while building America's great infrastructural achievements of the 20th century, the dams, the rural, uh, rural electrification, and so much more, and repositioned America on the world stage, as well as creating a new paradigm of possibility for the country. His life story was chronicled, uh, chronicled in the book Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism, and the Common Good, and it was written by our guest Stephen Fenberg. This book became the award-winning hour-long documentary on PBS uh, called Buddy, Can You Spare a Billion?, which we excerpted, of course, at the outset of this program. So, Stephen, welcome to It's Our Money. It's great to have you with us uh, today. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm always happy to talk about Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and how both of them exemplify the best of capitalism, public service, and philanthropy. Yeah, that's great. I loved your title, Unprecedented Power. Uh, what's really impressive to me is how they pulled this off. I mean, you just couldn't do that today. Congress is so divisive, and we've got a divisive media that, you know, throws blame all over the place when people just don't get together like they seem to do in the 1930s. And just from watching old movies, you get the sense that there was a different sense of, you know, what it was to be an American or to be a farmer or whatever, a community person. There was just more of a community spirit. Like we, you had homeless people that would wander by, you know, into a farm or whatever, and the farmer would take them in. I mean, that just would not happen today. They wouldn't trust them. So I just wondered if you could go into that, the difference in the whole political system. And well, I mean, probably we should have you first tell Jones's story, but I, that's the part that it really impressed me is how they did it. Something that we may have to do again. And will we be able to pull that off? That's the question. But anyway, you probably would be great to have you start with just who Jones was and how he pulled himself up from you know, I mean, how he got to where he was and what he did for Houston, all those things. Thanks. I'll be glad to. And, and in response to your comment about the difference between then and now, 
it's hard for us to even have leaders or heroes for that uh, matter because we tear everybody down no matter what they've done who they are we find fault with them and destroy them and we can't have real leaders anymore who can guide us to where we need to go as a nation and i'm i'm glad that during jones's time he was able to assume unprecedented power because he had the trust of the public and of congress both sides of the aisle liked him and understood what he was doing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was started by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover. And Roosevelt, when he was inaugurated, expanded its power. He didn't cancel it because it had been started by another party and another president. He understood its power and its capacity to become the nation's lender of last resort when it was so desperately needed after all the banks had closed in the nation. Everything was shut down when FDR became president. But he turned to Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, essentially, to save the economy, first by buying preferred stock in banks, which was duplicated in 2008 under the Troubled Asset Relief Program, better known as TARP. They duplicated what Jones and the RFC had done in 1933 to save the United States banking system. The RFC stepped in and bought preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again and to get the frozen wheels of the economy to turn. The trouble was the bankers, once they sold their preferred stock to the federal government, hoarded the cash and they wouldn't lend it out because they were so frightened with what had just happened during the economic calamity. So the RFC and Jesse Jones said, if you don't lend this money, the federal government will have to step in as the lender of last resort and, and start getting the economy to turn again. And that's precisely what happened. And it ended up building the, the, the highways, tunnels, bridges, dams, aqueducts. It financed the development of high-speed trains. It brought electricity to rural America when only 20% of the people living in the country had power. And then it financed the purchases of appliances so they could plug into the modern age. And what really caught my attention about this from the get-go and why I've spent so much time on this is all these vital programs helped millions of people, saved the economy, and made money for the federal government at the same time. And when I discovered that, I thought, why aren't we looking at this today and how we can apply those same strategies to some of our own issues? I think the Rural Electrification Administration and the Attendant Electric Home Farm Administration, which help people buy appliances, is perfect strategy for today when we want to expand broad band access to underserved areas and help people wire their homes for the digital age. It can also be used as a strategy to help people retrofit their homes so that they're energy efficient and storm resistant. So all of these programs that were so successful in the past can be applied today if we will just look back at them and learn from them. Well, I'd say one of the things that you that that you just mentioned, which was very important and and germane to today's situation, in 08 and 09, as you pointed out, they recapitalized the banks that were that had gone belly up, but they didn't put any money into the economy, and that and the banks withdrew their credit all over the place. I mean, which is uh, happening right now as and, well. Exactly. And so uh, the, so what was really amazing in part, right, the, the lesson was, don't give the money to the bankers, make the bankers extend credit. And that was uh, one of the breakthroughs, put money into not just the banks, but into uh, productive economic activities. Well, and, and Jesse Jones and the RFC always gave the private sector first chance to do everything. And if it wouldn't do it, or it couldn't do it, the RFC would step in and do what was necessary to save the United States economy. And I think so what's even- Can you expand on that? So how did it give the private sector the first chance? Like gave them money or just said- No, no, no. They, they said, here is our program. Do you want to participate with us in this? And, you know, that because the RFC and Jesse Jones knew what was required to save the economy and to get it to go again. 
And they would always go to the bankers or to whoever was going to be involved with the program and say, do you want to participate with us in this? And they would always give them first choice. For instance, when I talk about the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, they partnered with utility companies, cooperatives, and cities to expand uh, the grid, essentially, which is something we so desperately need to do as we talk about fortifying our grid to accommodate all the electricity that's going to be needed to, you know, make cars go, for instance. They partnered with everybody they could. And if, if they couldn't get people to collaborate with them, the federal government would do it on its own. And nobody seemed to resent it too much. I mean, there was always a faction that wasn't going to like what the federal government's going to do. But the Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, and liberals embraced the RFC because they knew it. Well, first of all, the RFC made loans in every congressional district in the United States. So they appreciated what the RFC could do and how they were revitalizing their communities. I mean, it's so important to understand that the RFC programs really worked by 1936 after FDR had been in, in uh, office for four years, industrial output had doubled and Detroit was making more cars in 1936 than it had been in 1929 and employment had dropped by 8%. So these mm -hmm. programs were working and people appreciated it and could see it and embraced it as a positive power of the federal government. They didn't demean it and, and say that government is evil. In fact, uh, Jesse Jones would frequently say, I remember something in a speech he said in 1937 about economic recovery. He said, it will not be possible if we allow ourselves to believe that our government is our enemy. And I think that part of what we would like to see happen also requires a shift in our attitude about the power of government. Right. <laughs> Our sense of community is, uh, is I think, recovering on some levels, though, uh, where the, the local economies have become more important uh, and the government support is being recognized as being a, a really critical component. Uh, since capitalism really has failed so many at this point, um, I, was, I was surprised to see that socialism was a big concern on the part of the bankers and the politicians back then. They were putting, this is, your plans are all socialist. Why, you know, and yet they let, they let this go through. How do they, do you think we get away with that now? <laughs> well, I, I think that what we need to do is look back to see how World War II was won. Uh, so again, back to the RFC, we had talked about the Great Depression and what it had done for the economy from 1932 to, let's say, 1939. But at that time, the RFC shifted its focus from domestic economics to global defense. Hmm. The United States military in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, was ranked 17th in the world in terms of its size. We were completely unprepared to participate in World War II. But all of the sudden, after legislation had been passed to allow the RFC to build, buy, or lease plants of any kind that was required for national defense, within months, our little tiny military became the arsenal of democracy through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the nation's infrastructure bank. And Roosevelt's hands were tied because neutrality acts forbid the United States from sending arms to warring nations. And about 80% of the nation was opposed to military intervention of any kind unless the United States was directly attacked. So FDR learned he had another option by turning to Jesse Jones and the RFC. When he couldn't get something through Congress, he would just turn to Jesse Jones and the RFC, which by then really had its own power of the purse because it was so enormously successful. It could write checks for billions of dollars if it wanted to. It didn't. It was never, it never, never a hint of scandal at the RFC throughout Jesse Jones's administration from 33 to 45. And so can you go into where it got those billions. <laughs> sorry. Where it got those billions of dollars that it was writing checks for. It got those billions of dollars from the successful programs it initiated and managed. It was initially funded by the Treasury, I think, with 500 
can't remember, $500 million. Yeah, yeah, but all yeah. that capital was eventually returned to the Treasury with a profit because the RFC's programs through its dividends and interest, it was a lending program, not a spending program. And I think that's so important as we talk about a new infrastructure bank as proposed by the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, which I think is just essential. It was a lending program, not a spending program, and it expanded the economy during the worst of the Great Depression, helped millions of people, and it returned a profit to the federal treasury and to the taxpayers. But back to World War II, because I think this is so essential when we talk about socialism. So Roosevelt turned to Jesse Jones and the RFC, and he says, you go to Congress to get legislation passed to allow the RFC to begin militarizing industry because you can get things passed quicker than I can. This is Roosevelt to Jones. So Jones, indeed, he went to Congress in June of 1940. This legislation was passed. So the RFC essentially began building enormous plants to manufacture tanks, trucks, airplanes, synthetic rubber, everything that was required to fight and win World War II, the RFC built, and then at least these enormous plants to corporations to operate. Hmm. That's socialism. Yeah. And nobody complained about it back then. Uh, and it was never Jones's or, or FDR's intention to nationalize anything. They wanted to save capitalism, save democracy, and they would use any tool at their disposal to meet those goals. And they did. So the RFC and the federal government owned gigantic capacity to manufacture just about anything. For instance, it owned 70% of the aviation industry by the end of World War II. It had financed the expansion of Boeing, for instance. General Motors was, was manufacturing uh, airplane engines. But all of this at the end of World War II, and they had planned this way before there was victory, that they would reconvert the economy and sell all of this capacity back to the private sector. And that's what happened. And that was also the cause of the expansion of the middle class after World War II. So I'm, I'm saying all this to address this issue of socialism when we talk about the power of good government. Look at how World War II was won before you start labeling things socialism as something right. bad. Yeah. And also the fact that the RFC sold bonds to the Treasury, which put the Treasury heavily in debt. And yet, you know, it di it didn't hurt because development, manufacturing and development came up to meet it. So you had supply and demand. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go into and, and, if, and if I understand it correctly, the RFC paid back all the all the money that it ever was was borrowing from the federal treasury in the term in the way of bonds. It was financing. It was so successful. The RFC was financing the spending programs like the. Uh, PWA, the WPA, was partially funded by the RFC, which was doing its own lending, but then it was also financing the spending programs, which Jesse Jones resented a little bit. And whenever he would make a presentation, he would recite three numbers, how much the RFC had loaned, how much the RFC had been repaid, and how much he had had to allocate to the spending programs, because he really thought that the lending programs were the key to economic revitalization, and then, of course, to militarizing uh, industry in time to fight and win World War II. Yeah. It, well, it's, a, it's a stunningly successful story. It, it's, uh, it's, all, it's almost fanciful to imagine such a thing. Uh, and as we look at uh, America in 2023, um, I, I'm wondering, you know, Jones was such a powerful individual and, and person, persona with a proven track record and an entrepreneurial uh, spirit and, and history. Do, will we, do you think we need someone like that to do that? Or is this something that is this an urge or a, a prospect that we could muster together as a political body? Well, as I said earlier, it will take a huge shift in our attitude about government among a huge portion of our population. Mm -hmm. Government is not bad. It is not evil. It's the only thing we have to orchestrate what needs to be done on a grand national scale. And until we get over our fear of government, I think it's going to be really hard to find an individual 
or to have a body that will be able to do these massive things that are required, whether it's rebuilding our infrastructure. Look at the opposition that there is to something so basic and simple as that. Water systems are collapsing. The RFC built water systems. It did all of the things that are required to do today. And during the Great Depression, it did all these things and it made money for the federal government at the same time. Nothing was nationalized. Everything was done to preserve capitalism and democracy, just as it was during World War II. I mean, when we talk about, let's say, uh, rare earth materials, which are, are becoming hard to get, or we're vulnerable because of the supply of them, all we need to do is look at the RFC and what it did during World War II. I think the development of synthetic rubber is just yeah. a great example. Amazing. We didn't have synthetic rubber. And, and when Pearl Harbor occurred, the Japanese captured almost all of our supplies of natural rubber in the Pacific Ocean. But once again, Jones and the RFC had taken the initiative well before that. They were proactive. They saw that we were vulnerable there. And the RFC orchestrated the development of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production in time to address this calamity of no more natural rubber. And without that initiative, the Allied forces might have been stuck in place and unable to fight because they had no rubber to field their tanks and their trucks and uh, their airplanes that were so required, you know, to have this natural, this synthetic rubber to, to, to make them go. I, I love that scene in uh, Buddy, Can You Spare a Billion? in which, uh, back during the war, when everybody was called on to throw their rubber, to bring their rubber into the recycling centers, your old tires and uh, everything that you, everything that's rubber, bring it by because and, and throw it in uh, and stop driving so much. Don't use yeah, your car yeah. so much. Yeah. So there, you know, there is that element of American can-do-ness that I think we we uh, that is on the political horizon these days, perhaps in reaction to some of the uh, events and circumstances that we've been through, where we're starting to see maybe a possibility that we could actually work together on something like this, uh, but that we must do something like that. Uh, why did the RFC stop? What what happened? And what? Yeah. Uh. I think that it outlived its useful life, which was, you know, and again, when we look at Jones and the RFC as models, for instance, one of my favorite uh, organizations was the Electric Home Farm Administration, which financed the purchase of appliances for rural residents because they couldn't afford it. It was the Great Depression. But in 1943, they terminated the program. They liquidated it because it was no longer needed. No organization was meant to last in perpetuity. He knew everything had a useful life. Once it had ended, he said, it's time to liquidate it and move on. And that's, you know, they liquidated in 1943 after more than a million families had been helped. And as Jones said, and it returned a tidy profit to the government. He was a capitalist, you know, he, yeah. he was always looking at the bottom line. He was a banker. He owned Houston's biggest bank. But he also said that banking should be done not only for profit, but for the public good. He, he you know, thought about that with everything he did, whether it was in his own private business or in public service. So to answer your question, why did the RFC end? It really didn't end nobly, let's say. So Jones left government in 1945. Other people started leading it. And by the 1950s, it was kind of making some dubious loans. Jones uh, protested and thought that the RFC should be closed down. It's outlived its useful purpose. It morphed into the Small Business Administration, which I think also has got a great purpose. Mm. But in the late 1940s, early 1950s, it was making loans that Jones had, would never have made. And mm. you know, said these are companies that if they can't survive on their own without government assistance, they should go out of business and they should not be supported by the government. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if you could go into Jones's childhood, you know, just his personal story, how he got to be the man that he was. Sure. Uh, he was born and raised on his father's uh, very prosperous tobacco farm in rural Tennessee. Uh, in the, I guess he was born in 1874. And you know, people helped each other back then. They weren't relying on government to, to do things for them or to regulate things or to protect them. They all kind of looked out for each other. They were in a rural area that was remote. 
And I remember a story I read about Jones that, you know, his father always kept the smokehouse doors open. So if struggling neighbors needed to have something, they could come there and borrow something. And his aunt Nancy, who took care of the kids, would always watch to see who took what so she could get the <laughs> loans eventually repaid. So, you know, he learned both, you know, the, the benefits of charity and the benefits of getting loans repaid of good credit. He moved to Texas in 1898 to manage his uncle M.T. Jones's vast lumber estate after he passed away. And he landed in the middle of the civic aristocracy in uh, 1898 when only 40,000 people lived in Houston. Wow. But back then, most everything was locally owned, the banks, the newspapers, the insurance companies. And the local leaders understood they would prosper if their community thrived. So they were constantly building their own businesses and nurturing their community simultaneously. And Jones embraced that ethic. And you can see it in everything that he did. So, uh, you know, he he just he was in the right place at the right time. Uh, he was in the lumber industry. Then he, he extended his uncle's uh, what they called a double ender status. Uh, which meant he, I guess he was either vertically or horizontally integrated. I'm not sure which, <laughs> but he ended up using the lumber from the sawmills and the, and the lumber, the timberlands that they had to build small houses south of downtown uh, and, and uh, selling them on long-term installment plans, which was very unique back then. So people with modest means could afford to buy a house, but he also collaborated with the city of Houston to what they called back then grade and gravel streets that were mud back then. He couldn't afford to do it on his own. The city couldn't afford to do it on his own. He says, if you pay half, I'll pay the other half. I'll build these houses, sell them on long-term credit plans so people with modest means can mm -hmm. afford to buy homes. That was his first example of collaborating with government. That was expanded, though, to the Houston Ship Channel in the Port of Houston. A delegation went to Congress and convinced Congress to pay half the cost of dredging Buffalo Bio for the Port of Houston and the Houston Ship Channel. They came back all excited that the Congress had you know, agreed to this plan. It was the first time they had ever collaborated with a municipality to build infrastructure. But we had to raise half the funds to do it. They turned to Jesse Jones, who was a banker. He went to all his fellow bankers, uh, said, this is the best investment we could ever make in Houston's future and in our own futures. And he had raised the money within 24 hours and became the Houston Harbor Board's first chairman and built the wharves, the piers, uh, the infrastructure that was required to welcome ships from around the world to the port of Houston. So Jesse Jones, from the start, collaborated with government, saw government as a positive partner in the things that he wanted to do and that were required to do big things for the benefit of everybody. And, and used banking as the utility, as the tool uh, to make uh, the difference. And instead, you know, the, 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 instead of being robber barons, he was, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the husband of many great initiatives. That story and many others are in your book, which, there you go, uh, Unprecedented Power by Stephen Fend. You know uh, what, Fendi. if I may, I'm going to yeah. I'm gonna hold up the more recent edition. Oh, I see. Only because it has former Secretary of State James Baker's endorsement oh. okay. over a cover that has two Democrats on it. I see. But that just shows you, you know, how things have changed. You know, James Baker, you know, what he says is, a must read for those wanting to learn how a great nation and a great man can respond to difficult challenges, even though he was a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I would also <laughs> just add, uh, excuse me, Alan, for just a moment, I just want to tack in here that uh, this story is also told beautifully in the award-winning documentary that Stephen wrote for, uh, uh, that was uh, hosted by Walter Cronkite called Buddy, Can You Spare a Billion? We'll put a link to that YouTube in the, the program credits here. So thanks. And if, and if I may, that the accurate title is Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? Uh, which is a takeoff on you know, the, the Depression sure. era song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Yes. So this is Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? Because Jesse Jones during the Great Depression was dealing in billions of dollars, which a billion dollars is a lot of money now, but it was even a lot more money back then. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and the name of my book, I purposely put in there, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, because I 
hardly ever hear anybody talk about the common good. Yeah. And to me, that is essential. Yeah. One thing that impressed me was that it wasn't just about uh, monetizing projects that would pay back, but there was art involved. And like you, you pointed out about developing synthetic rubber, we didn't have synthetic rubber. So there's research and development that we could do that now to try and avoid the problem of um, the rare earth minerals that we need for batteries that, you know, we need to develop some alternatives that aren't so environmentally destructive themselves or that we don't have whatever and the artwork like in our the, the train station downtown here in LA there's these beautiful murals up on the uh, up on the walls I mean what was the that didn't pay back anything it just hired some artists that anyway do you want to talk about but it also enhanced life for everybody and Jones right. was a great advocate of the arts maybe not through the RFC but in Houston, as Houston was growing, he was always behind the people who were developing performing arts organizations. Uh, we had a, 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 a impresario here named Edna Saunders who brought performing arts organizations from all over the world to Houston when you know, we had a population of two or 300,000 people. She brought Enrico Caruso to Houston in the 1920s, but Jesse Jones was always behind her to back her financially if she got in trouble, but thank God she never did and, and he was never uh, called on to help her out, but he was always there in the wings because he understood that a, a great city needed great art and uh, I think that came from his early travels in Europe and the, at the turn of last century and he saw how vibrant these cities were and saw the museums and the performing arts and he wanted the same thing for Houston and uh, he did everything he could to not only build the city's tallest buildings but to also bring the arts to town. And of course, your your role as uh, as a manager, as a director of uh, some of the work of the Houston Foundation, uh, focused on on these areas of investment, uh, the arts. And uh, I was surprised to see his how progressive he was in his concern for racial equity and for suffrage, women's suffrage, and and the arts and other and and medical uh, education and so forth. Those are wonderful things. That the Houston Foundation is what two and a half billion dollars now in uh, in assets. Yeah, that's correct. It's Houston Endowment, and the Joneses Endowment. established it in 1937. And again, you know, everything I would learn about these people as I was doing research because they hired me in 1993, I think it was, to to write some things about Jesse Jones, and then also to assemble his archives of business and personal papers that were just massive, that eventually were all donated to Rice University at the archives there. Uh, but, you know, as I was going through these papers, every time I'd learn, I said, oh my God, I love these people. Look at what they did. And for instance, as you mentioned, uh, Suffrage, uh, he owned the largest newspaper in town, the Houston Chronicle. And in 1915, the Chronicle was editorializing to support women's rights to vote. That was, you know, five years wow. before that occurred. He was director general of military relief for the American Red Cross during World War One, And in that role, he organized all the battlefield medical aid that was supplied by the Red Cross. You know, the ambulance services, the canteens, he recruited 50,000 doctors and nurses, and he was called big brother to men in khaki, but he was also big brother to women because he wrote to President Wilson in 1918 that women serving in as nurses on the battlefields deserved military rank. They had no military rank or authority. He said, if if women are given military rank in, in World War I as they are serving on the fields, that will encourage them to pursue uh, careers in law, medicine, education. And this was 1918. When they moved back to Houston after about 13, 14 years of public service in Washington, D.C. during the Great Depression, World War II, they began to focus on philanthropy. They had established Houston Endowment in 1937, but it really took off when they came back from uh, Washington. And they started establishing these huge scholarship programs throughout mm -hmm. the state of Texas to help send men and women to college. And again, I would learn, I would see these things. I say, oh my God, look at this. The scholarship programs, which were huge, were always divided equally between men and women, 50% for men, 50% for women. 
and always for students of color. For instance, Prairie View A&M University uh, received a $50,000 scholarship program, which would be more than half a million dollars today. And it was for students of color, you know, so that they could also have access to education. So everything I've learned about these people, I like. And it was kind of hard for me to write my book sometimes because I didn't want it to be a puff piece, but I couldn't <laughs> really find too much bad to say about them. You know, he liked to drink, he liked to play cards, he told dirty stories. And in today's world, he would be demonized for doing such things. <laughs> I was wondering where he is now. We could, you know, if we can do a little resurrection would be great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do think the media is a major factor. I mean, I can remember we used to have one of those big old radios, you know, that was this big. It stood on the floor. And I mean, I was too young for Roosevelt, but I heard the, what was it? The shadow. We listened to the shadow every night and then we went to bed <laughs> when I was little. Yeah. But anyway, and my mother remembers when electricity came to the farms. And if all you had to listen to was this one Roosevelt's voice at night and you didn't have a lot of opposition, that, that would be very inspiring to you to know that you had a sensible leader who was on top of things and had a plan, all that sort of stuff. But now we have opposing plans all the time and way too much to consider. And we, the people, don't really have a vote, even though... You know what I mean? We don't have a vote on what they do once they get up there. So Well, and I think the trouble is with so much today, we're not talking about policy. We're talking about culture wars. Yeah. And, you know, that to me is such a disservice to our nation when what we should be focusing on are how do we accomplish great things again? Yeah. And instead, we're talking about, you know, other issues that to me should not be in government's purview. But that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, well, that whole the thing about we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. I mean, <laughs> that's totally true. And yeah. Rosie the Riveter, you know, we can do it, that, that whole spirit. Yeah. So the inspiration, this is so inspiring just to recount this person's life, but also the lives the people who accompanied him and the lives of America at that time uh, has now in the 21st century here we're at a moment of revival with the National Infrastructure Bank possibility and prospect. And of course, we'll be hearing more about that on this program from Alfeca Mutardi with the coalition. Maybe but, uh, she should ha head up a new RFC. I think she's so. fantastic. Uh, uh, so nominated. We'll look for a second. Yeah, um, exactly. Stephen, uh, thank you so very much for visiting with us and sharing this uh, wonderful and powerful story. Um, any any final words before we have to part? No, I mean, I, th I think we've covered it all. Uh, I think Jesse Jones, as I said at the very beginning, exemplifies the best of public service, good government, capitalism. And I hope that we will look at successes from the past for solutions today because they are there. That's, That's perfect. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for all Thank you. It's my pleasure for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Stephen. It's my pleasure to be speaking with Elfeka Mutardi, who is a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and now is chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. So, Elfeka, it's great to be speaking to you again. We we have interviewed you before, and we've heard all about the National Infrastructure Bank. We just interviewed Stephen Fenberg on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and Jesse Jones and how the Reconstruction Finance Corporation rebuilt the country in the 1930s at a time when the banks were bankrupt and the government didn't have much in the way of tax receipts because unemployment was way up. So we hope we're not heading into another depression, but there's a lot of signs that we're at least heading into a recession and we have huge infrastructure needs and the Congress is up against a budget ceiling. There's not much chance they're going to come up with funding for infrastructure. So we need a workaround like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and that's the whole idea of the National Infrastructure Bank. So we just wondered if you could give us an update on where that <laughs> bill is right now, or, you know, I know it's been, you know, it's going to get a new number, et cetera, and generally what the model is, what the plan is, and what all it could achieve for us right now. I would be very happy to do that. Thanks for having me again. For those viewers that can see me, I will be working through a few slides, but I will try to explain them for the radio audience as well. So we had a bill in Congress uh, in the last session. 
It was HR 3339. It's teed up and ready to be reintroduced into the current session, mostly slight, only slightly modified. What the bill does is it creates a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. So uh, why do we need such a bank, as you inti uh, intimated? It's because we simply are not able to finance infrastructure adequately, either through the federal budget, state and local budgets, municipal bonds, public-private partnerships. None of that's working, even though we had a bipartisan law pass a year ago. Uh, none of it is working to solve our basic fundamental infrastructure problem, and we need this bank to complement budgets and do all this financing for us. So that's the idea behind a public bank. Uh, actually, it's not a new idea, as uh, you uh, and Steve Stephen Fenberg have intimated. We've had uh, four really large banks in our nation's past, starting after the American Revolutionary War, and going through the Great Depression and World War II, this is the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that was started by Republican Herbert Hoover, picked up by uh, uh, FDR and expanded on a bipartisan basis to get us out of the Great Depression and win World War II. So this proposal for a fifth bank is modeled on those earlier four. Uh, this is an explanation of how it works. The first thing you need to do to open uh, a, a bank like this, any bank, is to get it capitalized. Instead of going to the, the budget and asking for money to capitalize the bank, we go to the private sector who are holding about $26 trillion in treasuries for savings or investment purposes, ask what they like to sell in a really small portion of them into the NIV in exchange for preferred stock that will pay them a little extra. That extra stream of money would come out of earnings from the NIB's in loans, and then there will be plenty of money left over to be make, meet this bank's other operational needs. That is, this bank is self-sustaining, doesn't require infusions from the budget to get it started or subsidize operations over time. Then that capital sits on the bank's books, not used up in any way. All banks are required to maintain about a dollar in capital for every $10 in loans that they give out. So that's the capitalization side of opening the bank. This explains how the lending works. And actually, it works exactly like a commercial bank. Each time the, the NIB will create and book a loan on one side of its books, what happens is its accounting software automatically creates a deposit on the other side of its books so that they match. And then uh, whenever you're creating a new deposit like this, you're actually adding to the nation's money supply and then uses cash on hand coming in from other things to circulate money out of that new deposit and through the rest of the banking system. So that's the way the loans work. The loan terms are very advantageous because this is a public bank and we want to keep financing costs down for the borrowers to the extent that we possibly can. Uh, the borrowers would be state and local governments, any public entity like a city, a county that owns a road or a bridge or a school can come in directly to the NIB to request a loan. I would say that the loan procedures are going to be a lot more simpler than they are for, say, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, and we'll have technical assistance engineers in the back office to help local jurisdictions formulate and manage these loans as well. So we cover $5 trillion in loans, as I mentioned, um, in 20 different infrastructure categories that are defined in the bill. And uh, um, what, what, where the figure came from is the American Society of Civil Engineers covers about 16 of these categories. That's what they track and say we need in additional money to fix everything including transportation systems, water systems, upgrading our electric power grid. And then our coalition added four more categories on a complete high-speed rail network all across the country, broadband everywhere, affordable housing, large-scale water projects to address drought where we grow our nation's food. If we don't take care of that, we'll have spiking food prices all across the country. So compared to the bipartisan law that passed over a year ago, that will be providing only about one-tenth of all the money that we need to fix everything. It's a great start. We're glad they passed it. Shows bipartisanism can work. But any state cannot expect to get out of that bill everything that it needs to fix its roads, bridges, transit, drinking and wastewater systems, nothing in there at all for affordable housing or high-speed rail. 
So if we're serious about fixing infrastructure, we're going to need the National Infrastructure Bank or the NIB to top up and provide the other 90% of the financing still missing from the financing picture. Not only can we fix all of America's infrastructure, but we can create millions of new great paying jobs. We can reshore American manufacturing again because the inputs must be made in America. We can get our GDP growth up to maybe twice what it's been historically, and it's been really low historically, and so has our productivity. Uh, all that'll be great for businesses because they'll be able to produce more with the same dollar amount of inputs, and so their, their earnings will grow. Uh, it'll be great for state and local governments because with new GDP growth, their revenues coming into their coffers will be growing. All of this with no new federal taxes, spending, or debt, and it will reduce inflation as well because uh, we'll be producing more. As we produce more and we have more goods uh, available, their prices will come down and it'll offset any coming recession. Let me talk about that. We are clearly headed for an economic recession. Uh, since we talked last, the economic indicators are all flashing red. Uh, we have one indicator, for example, that's called the uh, Conference Board Leading Economic Index, which combines about 10 different things that uh, usually lead uh, or, or occur before a recession. And when, they, when, the, when that index turns, when it peaks and then turns downward, we normally have a recession some 10.6 months later. Our current peak our latest peak was in 2021, and now that index has been heading downward for 15 months. So we are way past due for a recession. And then we have another problem, which is that the Federal Reserve policy to tamp down on inflation is raised interest rates way too fast, and the banking system is choking on it. So not only uh, would this be a challenge for the National Infrastructure Bank, but it's the challenge for all banks. We've already seen three banks go down. It's not the end of the picture. Uh, they're not making money. They're squeezed. They have an economic squeeze because um, they've lent out a whole lot of loans on low fixed interest rates. And now their borrowing costs are shooting way up as the Federal Reserve raises its federal funds rate. Uh, but no bank can sustain that as finances are upside down. And then to add insult to injury, depositors are not getting returns on their deposits that they want. They're only getting still zero to half a percent interest rate. So they're taking their deposits out of the bank and they're putting them into non-banks. And that's really upsetting the apple cart for the banking system. So altogether, this looks really bad. Uh, we may not have seen the worst of what is yet to come. Uh, if we have a full-blown financial crisis on top of the recession, both of which are caused by Fed policy, then we will see huge unemployment. And the way that the National Infrastructure Bank can help is the same way that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation helped before. It can hire up all of these people into great paying jobs, train them up for 21st century jobs that will be permanent. This will be a permanent source of long-term funding for infrastructure. That's what we need. And uh, it'll hire them up into these great paying jobs uh, that will reduce unemployment and the severity. There won't be any plan B coming from the budget. What happened during the COVID recession was the federal government spent something like $3.5 trillion in stimulus checks to bail us out of that thing. But that's not going to happen again because now we're in, uh, as Ellen mentioned, a debt crisis and a debt uh, um, standoff uh, in the Congress over the national debt. So it won't happen again. If we slip into a recession, this will be the only mechanism around that will be able to pull us out of it. Rebuild our infrastructure, rebuild our economy. That's the, uh, the, the idea behind the thing. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Becca. So... I, and I might mention that the, the first three banks that you didn't really go into, the first two were the first and second U.S. banks, which were on the Hamiltonian model, which was basically the Bank of England model where you you can leverage your funds at 10 to 1, like you've got a certain amount of capital and then you leverage it at 10 to 1. But with the difference that it followed the Hamiltonian 
it was all about development. So the money should be used for infrastructure and development and industry. That worked very well. Well, at the first U.S. Bank didn't do all that much in the way of development, but the second U.S. Bank did, and it built the Erie Canal, among other things. But those were shut down by Jackson. And then we went on to the National Banking Act, which was not actually a national bank, but a whole series of national banks. The capitalization included bonds from the banks themselves. So those were our forerunners. So I got an objection that when I did a pre- presentation recently, I was saying how oh, the Chinese did it. You know, they built all this infrastructure and largely through these infrastructure banks national infrastructure banks where they just issue the money as credit, build the thing, and then the proceeds from what they built goes back to pay back the loan. And somebody said, oh, so you want us to model on the communist system and or the Chinese system? And I said, no, it's this was the original American system. It was our system first. And then it spread around the world. And then just in the last whatever, since the 70s, at least, we've uh, we've lost that system and gone to what's called a neo- neoliberal finance or however you want to define it, where the speculators get the money first and they use it for private speculative purposes. Uh, you mentioned about how the on the infrastructure bank bill that Congress did pass, it was the one thing that they did manage to do where both sides agreed on it. But it seems like in general, the only thing we both sides agree on is funding the military, which is, you know, they can always find the money for the military And that's all about national security, but nobody's really looking at our security when we drive over one of these bridges that's what passed its due, you know, cell date, (laughs) by cell date, that these bridges that are due to collapse or uh, water that's poisoning children, et cetera, or just lack of water and therefore lack of food. I mean, our own internal security is in jeopardy right now, and people aren't really looking at that as a national emergency, but it actually is. Uh, Can you talk a bit about some of the projects that might be undertaken by the NIB that we really seriously need? Right. That's a great uh, point that you bring up about the, the federal budget. What happened with the bipartisan infrastructure law, as you said, it was developed in the Senate and it started out at like $2 trillion and it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because members of Congress couldn't agree to raise taxes to finance infrastructure. They're always willing to find money to to beef up and expand the military budget. It's really a shame because that is not money that spends or benefits the American economy. Really, who it benefits is the military industrial complex. That's the shame of it. And nobody's calling our, both Republicans and Democrats, by the way, do this. Now it's happened that they're actually tacking on infrastructure projects onto the military budget in the name of security. For example, they tacked on some $30 billion for a seawall along the Texas Gulf Coast to protect the oil refineries and the port of Houston in case there should be a big hurricane that would take out that port. And it could absolutely happen. We want we want to put the focus on American infrastructure. It is dilapidating. Just to give you a case in point, 60 Minutes last month re-ran a 2014 Steve Cross piece where they looked at American infrastructure, especially in places like uh, Pennsylvania where bridges are collapsing, the pillars underneath the bridges. Um, They just managed to avoid a huge catastrophe of one of those bridges collapsing. Another one did collapse in Pittsburgh. And the, the piece concluded that Congress doesn't want to raise taxes to pay for these things. So if that's our constraint, let's use a national infrastructure bank like we did four times before in our nation's history that were very successful. It's dedicated just to channeling new credit into rebuilding infrastructure. And how does that not only fix infrastructure, keep us safe, but it also really expands the American economy. Every dollar that you borrow and put into an infrastructure project plows back $3 into the economy. Even a DOD defense report from last year said that that payback 
for infrastructure is much higher than it is for defense spending. So where's the logic of the thing? We should be doing this and the National Infrastructure Bank can help. It can build out projects that are keeping us unsafe. We have poisoned lead poison. We have poisonous uh, lead pipes in all over the country. We have PFAs that are getting into the water supply and need new filtration systems. We have all these dangerous bridges that are about to collapse. Heck, there was one inspector that found a bridge on I-40 crossing from Tennessee into, into Kentucky. And that and he found a huge broken uh, steel beam on the thing. It was like, you could see the crack in the thing and the whole steel beam was, was off center. And he immediately called 911 and had the police come and shut down the whole freeway. So this is, this is dangerous. We need to work on these things. And we have a workforce that is really in disarray. We have upwards of 30, maybe in some, in some cities, 50% of our workforce doesn't earn enough money at their full-time or two or three jobs to sustain their family. They're not making ends meet to pay their rent, which have been exploding, their food bills, their, their health bills, all of which have been exploding. They can't make it. Uh, they need great new high paying jobs and we can shift the workforce out of these thousands of Starbucks, you know, um, baristas and, and things like that and put them into these great paying jobs. And the time to do it is when we have a big, huge recession, which could be coming. And also when we increase GDP, that is anti-inflationary. So the Fed is trying to bring down inflation by raising interest rates, which merely hampers industry. It prevents our ability to build more because everything's more expensive and we already have supply chain problems. In fact, a good argument can be made that this inflation is not about supply. It's about, I mean, not about demand. It's not about too much money. It's too few goods. We need more goods. We need to raise GDP. And that's what an infrastructure bank would do. So that's the same thing that during the 1940s, when the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was used to fund World War II, the national debt went way up, but GDP went way up as well. And so after, after the war, we didn't have inflation because they, they stayed in balance. Anyway, do you want to comment on that a bit? You're absolutely right on that. Um, we, we have economic models to show this, but the everyday facts are that we need to produce more. We need to produce it in this country. We need to, to iron out all our supply chain problems. That means getting trucks to move faster, getting them out of ports or getting uh, you know, our trucking, our, our delivery system working better. We all together, when we increase our productivity and it's way down right now, our uh, productivity, the, how much we pr can produce for every input of labor that we put into it is at rock bottom right now. And that means that we're not, we're hiring more workers and there is a shortage of the labor supply, but we're not producing more. And when we invest in infrastructure, we make the economy much more productive. So that means that for every input that you're able to put in at the bottom, you're able to produce ever so much more out the top. That increases the profits for companies. It also increases the supply of goods. We'll be able to make food better, faster, cheaper. We'll be able to make a new manufacturing items in our country. That'll expand all throughout the network. We can become a manufacturing center again like we were after World War II, when our economy was growing like gangbusters, but hasn't been since then. And what that setup was from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Exactly. The development they did. Exactly. And can, can you talk just a bit on where the bill is right now and how, how much support you have and what you're looking for? <laughs> right. We have a huge grassroots campaign that is assisting the NIB coalition all across the country. They are activists, union representatives, but significantly, they are members of legislators, members of state and county and city legislatures who recognize they're not getting what they need from the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's not going to filter down to them. And so they're willing to go to their members of Congress and push to get this legislation reintroduced into Congress. Right now, the main sponsor, Congressman Danny Davis from Illinois, is really very interested in getting a Republican co-sponsor to make this bill bipartisan. Under the last session, we got 20 members of Congress to co-sponsor. They were all Democratic. But this makes sense. 
for both Republicans, Democrats. It's not a it's not a red or a blue issue. It will bring in infrastructure into every single state, every rural community, every inner city community. It'll work to fix things for everybody. And so it's really important to see if we can get this bill bipartisan and we're it's sitting waiting now and we're active our coalition is actively talking to legislators all over the country we had a great call today with legislator from Pennsylvania a few days ago one from New York was discussing the merits of this bill compared to other possible pieces of legislation this is the only one that can deliver the goods get the money into rural and all areas and it's big enough to move the economy, the needle on the economy, and uh, get the job done. So it'll work just like previous banks that have been successful. If anybody on your call wants to call their member of Congress, ask them to support the Danny Davis bill, which is teed up and ready to be reintroduced, they can do so. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Becca. I guess that's all the time we have for today, but super talking to you and good luck in the National Infrastructure Bank. We'll talk again. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. I was speaking with Alfa Mutardi, who is a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and now chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, which is at uh, NIPCoalition.com. Yeah. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.